Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at sections 11.3 and 11.4 of Chapter 11. Now, 11.3 gets into properties of liquids, and remember, liquids were one of the substances, liquids and solids, and constant condensed states of matter that had attractive forces. So it shouldn't be a big surprise that the strength of the attraction between particles can have a huge effect on properties of a substance or a solution. Liquids properties are heavily, heavily dependent upon intermolecular forces. One example of that would be viscosity. Viscosity is a resistance of a liquid to flow. Um, so thicker, more viscous substances don't flow very well. So viscosity is basically a resistance to flowing. Low viscosity substances flow well, high viscosity substances flow much more slowly. Now you may have heard the term viscosity related to oil commercials, which we'll come back to in a second when we get to our last bullet here. Now it's related to ease with which molecules move past each other. If you're gonna flow, you move past each other very easily. Well, what would prevent particles from moving past each other easily? Intermolecular forces. So viscosity is going to increase with the strength of our intermolecular forces, and it's also going to decrease with higher temperature. We're going to come back to that in a second. First, let's look at the intermolecular force situation. Now, we have a table here of different types of hydrocarbons, and you'll notice what's happening is we keep adding a carbon. So hexane is the smallest, and then heptane, octane, nonane, and decane. So what we're really doing in each of these cases is we're increasing the size of our molecule. Well, remember LIMPAC. Larger, more polarizable electron clouds make stronger intermolecular forces. So it shouldn't be a great surprise that as we go from hexane to heptane to octane, we would increase our boiling point. It should be harder to boil because we have stronger intermolecular forces. Well, it's also going to increase our viscosity, which is what we're looking at here. So the higher the intermolecular force, in these cases, stronger London forces, the stronger or higher the viscosity is going to be. Now, where does temperature come in? Well, if you heat up a substance, you're not really affecting the intermolecular forces per se, but in the end, you do have an effect on the relevance of the intermolecular forces. As you heat up a substance, you make the particles move faster. And remember, distance and speed kill attractive forces. Well, as you make particles move faster, you're diminishing the strength of the intermolecular forces. The intermolecular forces themselves aren't weaker, but the relevance are because speed, kinetic energy, is overcoming those intermolecular forces. So when you increase the temperature of a substance, you're effectively decreasing the intermolecular forces. Well, that would decrease the viscosity. So something like maple syrup, which is a thick, viscous substance we pour on pancakes, well, if it's coming out really slow, heat it up in the microwave. And that will make it much, much, much thinner. It's lowering the viscosity as you increase the temperature. And this also plays a huge factor in something you may have seen in TV commercials. Viscosity and viscosity breakdown, which is um, Valvoline commercials have often used this, but several others have talked about it as well. As you heat up an oil, remember an oil's job is to lubricate and allow metal pieces to move against each other with little friction. Well, you need the oil to exist between the metal pieces and stay there. In other words, you want it to be viscous. You want it to be sticky and stick together. Well, as the oil gets hotter when the engine runs very hot, you lower the viscosity of the oil and it becomes thinner and thinner and thinner. It can actually get squeezed out between your moving metal parts and viscosity breakdown is a huge problem with your engine. If the oil is too thin, it's not going to lubricate properly. You're gonna get huge frictional amounts of energy and you can literally weld an engine together. Um, so it stops functioning when the metal parts which are supposed to move past each other weld together. So viscosity breakdown is a huge importance in your automobile engine. And that's really looking at the viscosity relationship to temperature. Now, another type of property of liquids would be surface tension. Surface tension is like a skin on the surface of the liquid. You have to break through to enter it. What you're really doing when you're breaking through the surface of the liquid is you're increasing the surface area of the liquid. Well, it takes energy to do that, and that's what surface tension is. The amount of energy required to increase the surface area of a liquid by a unit amount. So how hard is it to increase its surface area? That's what surface tension is. And remember, you have to break through surface tension to get into a liquid. So if you've ever done a belly flop, you've run afoul of surface tension. Now, surface tension results from a net inward force of attraction experienced by molecules on the surface of a liquid. If you take a look at our diagram to the right here, when we're looking at a molecule in the middle, it has intermolecular forces being exerted in all directions, and they tend to balance each other out. But on the surface, you have no attractions 
in an upward direction. So there's an imbalance of force on the surface of a liquid. And that imbalance of force is what you have to overcome to enter the surface of the liquid and push those particles apart. So surface molecules are actually packed more closely together and are actually more dense than the rest of the particles inside that liquid. And this causes liquids to have a skin. It's an attractive force that you have to overcome to actually break into the surface of the liquid. Water striders use this. You may hear people call them water spiders. Well, that's a mispronunciation. It's really a water strider. The water strider has legs that basically are very long, which increases surface area and diminishes the pressure that it pushes down on the liquid. And it literally pushes down with a small enough pressure that it can walk on the surface of the liquid. It can walk on that skin on the surface of the liquid. So it's a very light substance, which affects its pressure. And it has a high surface area in its feet, which also affects its pressure. If you lower the pressure enough, you can walk on the surface of a liquid. So surface tension is another common property of a liquid. And this is also related to intermolecular forces because the imbalance of force that exists becomes stronger the stronger the intermolecular forces that exist between the liquid. And it's going to also decrease with higher temperature. So it's harder for the water strider to walk on top of the water the warmer the water gets. Now, you can't break surface tension enough on water by just heating it up to affect the water strider because by the time you got to the point where it would start to break through because of that, you've already boiled the, the, the creature and killed it. Uh, but it does have an effect in a variety of other situations related to surface tension. So like viscosity, the increase in temperature um, is going to decrease the effect of surface tension. Now, there's two different types of intermolecular forces that, that are important in certain types of properties of liquids. One, you have your cohesive forces, which would be the intermolecular forces between similar molecules. So water molecules sticking together, that's a cohesive force. And then you have adhesive forces, intermolecular forces between substances of a different type. So if you have water in a beaker, the water molecules themselves are held together by cohesive intermolecular forces and the water molecule sticking to the side of the container. So the interaction between the water and the glass, that would be an adhesive force. And because you have different types of attractions between water and water and water and glass, there are differences to the strength of the cohesive versus adhesive forces. And now a direct consequence of this is meniscus, something you've seen before. It's a potential problem in graduated cylinders. So the graduated cylinder has to be designed to take into account the meniscus that water is going to form inside that measuring device. So it's designed to read from the bottom of the dip. Well, why does water um, form a concave meniscus? Well, it's because the adhesive forces are strong enough to overcome the cohesive forces, and the water molecules literally pull themselves up and creep up the side of the glass container. So you end up with a situation where there is a concave dip. Well, if you have a substance with a high enough intermolecular force that the adhesive forces become strong enough uh, compared to the cohesive, or I should say the cohesive forces become strong enough compared to the adhesive forces, you actually get an inverted meniscus. You get a convex surface on the top of mercury. And that's really caused by the difference between the intermolecular forces between the two substances, water to water and mercury to mercury, and those substances and the glass. So we can end up with literally different types of meniscuses depending on the situation. Now, meniscuses are one effect of this adhesive versus cohesive force. Another one is capillary action. If you have a thin enough tube, the water, which remember, crawls up the side of that tube inside a um, graduated cylinder. Well, remember, it's a fairly large diameter tube. Water is also being affected by gravity, and that pulls the water back down. So it creeps up the side only on the edges. Well, if you put it in a thin enough tube, the forces of attraction between the water and the glass are actually strong enough to overcome gravity, and it starts to creep up. But remember, the higher it creeps, the greater pressure it's going to have, the, the harder it is to overcome that. So there's a limit to how high it's going to creep up the narrow tube. But the more narrow the tube is, the higher it's going to creep up that tube. So capillary action is a direct result of this, and it's really when you have a small tube, a very low area. This is also really why water wicks into towels and cloth, because really 
through capillary action, you have very narrow tubes and very narrow spaces inside cloth. And when water touches the edge of it through capillary action, it creeps through the rest of it. So if you take a towel and lay it half in and half out of a tub, because of capillary action, the water will creep up the towel and then fall down the far side by gravity and end up all over the floor. So capillary action is something that gets you, know, you see in terms of water getting substances wet, like clothing. It's also useful in terms of uh, trying to get a little drop of water into a thin tube. If you have blood, because you want to do a blood test, you only need a little bit of blood for some of the types of blood tests. Well, if you get a small pinprick and you start to develop a pool of blood, touch a thinly walled tool to it, or a narrow tube, and capillary reaction will cause that blood to literally go right up inside that little capillary. And then you can take that and you can push it out to test it more easily. Next section, so our final section we're going to look at today, deals with phase changes. And this brings up some or concepts and some math ideas. First off, some concept type stuff. Well, phase changes, you need to understand all the different phase changes, changes between our three normal states of matter liquids, solids, and gases. So you need to know vaporization, condensation is liquid to gas and gas to liquid. Melting would be solid to liquid, freezing liquid back to solid. Those you're all comfortable with, but sublimation and deposition um, you're probably not quite as comfortable with. Although from pre-AP you should have been at least exposed to them. When you go from a solid directly to a gas, you have sublimation. And when you go from a gas directly to a solid, you have deposition. Um, and deposition is really a part of snowfall. You have gaseous water vapor in the air, and if it deposits and comes together and makes a solid, then you get snow. If it just condenses, then you're going to get liquid. Now, if it makes a liquid and that liquid freezes, then you get hail. So weather systems are dealing with differences in phases and how that's occurring with, with water. So you should be familiar with your different phases. Now, you should not only know what they are, but understand what's happening with energy and energy differences between the two. Because to take a liquid for, to a gas, or a solid to a liquid, or a solid to a gas, you have to spend energy. You have to overcome intermolecular attractions to make the molecules move farther apart. So consequently, when you're going the other direction, then you're releasing energy. So condensation, deposition, and freezing are all releasing energy. Those are exothermic situations. Vaporization, sublimation, and melting are all endothermic situations. You have to put energy in to make those happen. Now, when you take a look at the heats of some of these things, now heat effusion is a measure of the energy required to turn a solid to a liquid. So we're really looking at melting a, a solid at its melting point. Different substances have different heats of fusion. Different substances also have different melting points. Well, remember, melting points were tied to intermolecular forces. Well, so are these things. So really, what makes these forces different in terms of fusion, that's going from a solid to a liquid, or vaporization, which would be going from a liquid directly to a gas, how come these things have different vaporizations and different fusions? Well, I've already given the answer away. Um, why is vaporization larger than fusion? Well, what are you doing? You're trying to break things apart. You're trying to overcome intermolecular forces. Well, when you vaporize something, you're going from a liquid to a gas. You're totally breaking intermolecular forces. Remember, gases don't have intermolecular forces. That's going to take a lot of energy rather than going from a solid to a liquid, which is only partially overcoming intermolecular forces. So these different substances have different intermolecular forces. That means they're going to have different heats of vaporization and heats of fusion. And it also means heats of vaporization are going to be significantly higher than heats of fusion are for substances. It's all about intermolecular forces. It's a common thread throughout this entire chapter. Now, how come water's values are higher than those of butane but not as large as mercury? Well, I've already given the answer to that. It's the same idea. It's got to be also intermolecular forces. So the stronger the intermolecular forces, the harder it is going to be. In other words, the more energy you have to spend to change states. So we're looking at physical attractions, and, and that deals with uh, changes in intermolecular forces. Now, one thing that I found related to this, it's a really cool picture. Um, this is actually, I believe, taken in Russia. And this is a worker, I believe, at a mining facility where they use large quantities of mercury which is a very dangerous situation, by the way, because mercury does sublimate, which means you can breathe it in, it gets in your system, and it ends up affecting your central nervous system, and eventually will drive you insane, as well as cause all kinds of other physical conditions. But the intermolecular forces between water molecules are pretty strong. Do a belly flop, it hurts. But they're even stronger between mercury atoms. 
So the type of bonding we have here makes a much stronger type of attraction between the two. And literally, with Mercury, you can see that while he probably couldn't stand on it, because then he's exerting too great of a pressure, he could sit and actually sit on the top of a surface of Mercury. And that's because Mercury's intermolecular forces are so strong, which is why Mercury has higher heats of vaporization and fusion than the other substances here, which is also something that's helpful. If it's hard to vaporize, it doesn't become a vapor as easily. So while it does happen, so having open mercury around you is a potential problem, it doesn't vaporize near as much as other substances would because of its high intermolecular force. Now, molar heats of reaction are looking at energies of these different types of changes of state. The molar heat of vaporization would be the energy needed to vaporize one mole of a liquid. Obviously, uh, vaporizing more needs more energy, so we have to specify an energy amount. So notice in the balanced equation here, because this is an equation, um, you have one mole of H2O on each side, and you're going from a liquid to a gas. So that's going to take 40.7 kilojoules per mole. So molar heat of vaporization is literally the energy needed to boil a mole of a substance at its boiling point. So to vaporize it at its boiling point. Now, molar heat of condensation would be the energy that must be removed to condense one mole of gas. Since we're talking about the exact same process, but in reverse, it's endothermic, positive from the viewpoint of vaporization, but it's exothermic from the viewpoint of condensation. But notice, it's the exact same value. It's the sign that's different between the two. So the molar heat of vaporization is equal but opposite in sign to the molar heat of condensation. Same thing would be true with molar heats of fusion versus molar heats of solidification. Fusion is the energy needed to melt one mole of a substance. Solidification would be the energy needed to freeze one mole of a substance. You can see here that they're the same number once again, but opposite in sign. To melt a substance, we have to put in energy, it's endothermic, so positive delta H. And to freeze a substance, we have to remove energy, negative delta H. But once again, the values are the same, it's just that the sign is the opposite. Now this is important if you need to know these energies to do a math problem. Because when you look at a table, it doesn't usually list both. What it typically lists is molar heat of fusion, and on our previous page here, it typically lists the molar heat of vaporization. So what they do is they list our positive endothermic values. And what you need to recognize is the opposite value is just going to be the same number opposite sign. So you won't look up a heat of solidification, but if you have solidification, you need to look up fusion and multiply it by negative 1. So it's an important idea if you're using these energies to do calculations. So energy stoichiometry is what we're really talking about here. If we know the mass or the moles of our solid water, we can calculate how much energy it's going to take and whether that energy is going in or out, endo or exothermic. So that's kind of one of the places we're going with math in this section. Now, the next thing you need to understand is heating curves and what's happening with them. All solids, liquids, and gases have what's known as a heating curve. Basically, what's happening over time with temperature, and it's related to, you know, you're dumping in energy, how does that have a resulting change in temperature over time? That's what's known as a heating curve. Now, you need to understand the different parts of a heating curve. How come BC is smaller than DE? And, you know, what's happening with AB and CD? And e? You need to understand what's happening from a particle viewpoint and an energy viewpoint in all these different situations here. Now, first off, the heat added to the system at the melting point um, is really the energy needed to change a solid to a liquid. Well, when you're doing that, you're pulling the molecules farther apart from each other. Um, so literally, you're separating those molecules and overcoming intermolecular forces. So in this particular region, the heat added at its melting point and its boiling point, in these two regions here, which are the red regions, notice our temperature is not changing. And that's because all of our energy, in effect, is being spent to overcome intermolecular forces, partially in the case of solid to a liquid and totally in the case of liquid to a gas. Why is DE long, longer than BC? Well, it takes more energy to vaporize something than it takes to melt something. We talked about that earlier. earlier. So you should understand why that length is greater. You also need to understand why temperature is not changing. 
if you are not speeding up particles and instead you're breaking intermolecular forces, which a change in potential energy, not a change in kinetic energy, your temperature is not going to change. So if your kinetic energy is not changing because you're spending energy to change potential energy, if your kinetic energy is not changing, then your temperature is not changing. So at a state, change in state, your temperature is constant. And you need to understand why it's constant. It's because your energy is being spent not to increase kinetic energy, but to change potential energy. Now, this energy in, uh, involves then changes in potential energy, not kinetic energy. If you're not changing kinetic, you're not changing temperature. Now, the energy calculated in these particular regions, so if we are changing state, not warming something up or cooling something off, but if we're changing state, so the energy during a change in state, we use this equation. Q equals delta H of the reaction times the number of moles or the mass. It really depends upon whether this is a molar heat of reaction or not. If it's the energy per gram, you multiply by mass. If the energy per mole, you multiply by moles. So the units of our delta H of reaction are going to determine whether we multiply by this or multiply by that. So pay attention to units. Pay attention to units. Pay attention to units. So watch out for your units of delta H. It's going to determine whether you multiply by moles or mass. So it's really just multiply two things. But you need to get the delta H of reaction from a table. And remember, be aware. You're not going to see all of them. You're going to see some of them. You'll see fusion and you'll see vaporization. So if you're dealing with the other opposite situations, you have to provide the negative in your delta H. So watch your units. That determines whether you multiply by mass or mole. And watch what type of reaction it is. That's going to determine whether you use a positive or negative delta H. Now, the other type of math problem involved in um, a heating curve is what's happening in our blue sections here. A to B, we're warming up ice. C to D, we're warming up liquid water. And E to F, we're warming up water vapor. So the heat added during these regions is going to changing temperature, which means we're changing kinetic energy. So you're not overcoming intermolecular forces. What you're doing is moving faster. So in these three regions, this is dealing with changes in kinetic energy. This is something you got to be really aware of because students tended to struggle with these ideas on the test last year. So make sure you understand the difference between the red and the blue. Now, if it's a different energy situation, it's got to be a different energy calculation. So if we want to find the Q in these regions, we use MC delta T. So we're changing temperature. All we need is the specific heat of the substance. Now, specific heats vary. Why do they vary? Differences in intermolecular forces. Some substances are easier to heat up than others. It's tied to intermolecular forces. It also is dependent upon the mass. Obviously, the more substance you've got, the more heat changes involved. So what it comes down to is you have two different equations that you use under different situations. So what happens if we're doing both? If a reaction involves both types of energy situations, you have to do a combination of problems. So you have to look at what is happening within single states and calculate that energy individually and what is happening with changes in state and calculate that energy individually. So if we have a heating curve that looks like this, we have three calculations we have to do. We, this would be a warming up situation. Now, if this was a solid to a liquid, this would be you know, warming up a solid. That would be a molar heat of fusion that we need to look up. That's going to be this situation. Same thing here. Whenever we've got a delta T, we're going to be looking. Oops, I'm sorry. I wrote that the wrong direction. I'm standing in front of it here. We've got a delta T, so that's going to go to those two situations. So whenever we've got a change of state, we use MC delta T. Well, that's two different specific heats because the specific heat of solid substance is different than the specific heat of a liquid substance. So we have to do two different calculations there. And then finally, right here, we're melting the substance. That would be our heat of fusion. So that would be using this. Now, typically, these are molar heats of fusion that we're looking at. So we're going to be multiplying by moles in most cases. But we'd have to do three separate math problems if that's what our heating curve looked like. So if you're doing one of these questions in the homework, draw the heating curve. I can't say that loudly enough. If you can see the heating curve, and you can see what changes in temperature you're having in what states and what changes in state you have, then it's not that hard to determine how many math problems and what the types of math problems are going to be. But this is something you got to be watching out for. 
Now, the last idea I want to look at in these notes is um, critical temperature and pressure and how that's related to intermolecular forces and so on. Now, critical temperature is the highest temperature that a liquid phase can have. So above the critical temperature, the motions of the particles, the kinetic energy is so great, the attractive forces are irrelevant and you will not have a liquid, you will have a gas. So above the critical temperature, you only have the gaseous state. There's just too much kinetic energy, it overcomes all the other molecular forces, you have a gas. That's your critical temperature. Critical pressure is the pressure needed to cause liquefaction at the critical temperature. So how much can I play with pressure to eventually liquefy it back? So that's also going to be related to intermolecular forces. Now, if you look at a table of critical temperatures and critical pressures, what is the connection between intermolecular forces in these two things? Well, the easiest thing to do is look at a set of things where it's easy to understand the difference in intermolecular force. Well, nonpolar only has London forces. So let's look at some of the nonpolar substances. I know N2 is nonpolar, O2 is nonpolar, argon is nonpolar, and CO2 is nonpolar. So these are a set of nonpolar things. So the only type of intermolecular force is our London forces. So this is a little bit easier to see the connection between these. Now remember, LIMPEC, larger, more polarizable electron clouds means stronger intermolecular forces. So in this set, argon is going to be our lowest intermolecular force, and then nitrogen, and then oxygen, and then carbon dioxide. Really what I'm doing is comparing their molar masses. Remember, the higher the molar mass, LIMPEC. The larger, the more polarizable the electron cloud will be, and the stronger the intermolecular force. Well, if you have a strong intermolecular force, it's not only going to be hard to boil, but it's going to have a higher critical temperature. So the stronger the intermolecular force, the higher the critical temperature is going to be. And you can see that uh, trend also related to what's happening with critical pressure. So weaker intermolecular forces, the lower the critical points are going to be. The stronger the, the intermolecular forces, the higher the critical points are going to be. And that f finishes our notes over these two sections.